Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. You know, I, I, I have a, a story for you that I got to share. And the story I got to share is, is one that's absolutely, it, 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 it touched my heart. First, not in a good way, but then I think it'll be interesting for you guys to hear. Now, it's a Smith story. My wife and I took our granddaughter to Central Florida to see some ice sculptures. And I have two pictures to show you. The first picture is one of us first going in. And they keep it at nine degrees. And because it's at nine degrees, they give us coats and stuff, and we're all layered up. You guys got that picture for me? The very first one. Yes. As you can see, this is my, my wife and I and our oldest granddaughter. Her name is Zuhaley. And as you can see, we're, we're there, and we're all bundled up. And these are the coats that they give us because we're going to go through the exhibit, and it's nine degrees. After the exhibit, on the way out, give me the next picture, please. You can see that we come out, and they have a host of things that you can do that basically extract your money. And so what we, what we end up doing was we end up, you can see there, having a good time there. We got a, a bear. That's really a stuffed kitty. But as you can see that when we were there, we spent about an hour, hour and 15 minutes there. And what we're doing is we're doing our best to show our granddaughter a great, great time. And I think we did that. We laughed, we played, we enjoyed each other, up and down the escalators and all this stuff. As you can see by looking at her face, I feel that mission accomplished. Now, on the way to the car, <laughs> my wife and my granddaughter are holding hands, and out of the blue, she says, Grandma's a winner. Greta responds with, that's right. <laughs> to which Zuhaley follows up with, yeah, grandma always wins. Yeah, that's right. Now, I've heard that kind of banter before, but today it felt a little odd. <laughs> In particular, it felt odd because we had just enjoyed a fantastic grandpa-sponsored <laughs> event. And the simple fact that I was standing there and not being considered as a candidate for the win column was really starting to bother me. It began to dawn on me that somewhere in the Smith household, there's been some one-sided grandbaby teaching, and one of the grandparents was the odd man out. And it started to dawn on me that I was that odd man out. <laughs> so I, I, I do my best to, to let it slide, but we end up leaving and we get in the car. We're going to go to a restaurant to eat dinner. We just get out the car. We're not out in the car. Three seconds. They get out one side. She has to get her out of the car seat and stuff. They're walking across the front of the car. I'm closing the door. I haven't even chirped it yet. As my granddaughter walks by, holding my wife's hand, she looks at me and says, Grandma's a winner, not you. <laughs> you little, what the? <laughs> so, throughout the whole lunch, this baby giving me the business about that. Every now and then, yeah, Grandpa, grand, Grandma's a winner, not you. And this woman, who I'm married to, been married to for almost three years, just sitting there eating it up. Greta's not saying anything, just smiling. Just wait, I got you. Just wait, just smiling. Until the very end. Dinner's almost, lunch is almost over. Grandbaby looks at me again and says, Grandma always wins. Greta finally speaks up and says, Grandpa's a winner, too. Let's let Grandpa be a winner, okay? Now, I don't know what hurt me worst. <laughs> the fact that Greta had to ask 
and make a request of my grandbaby that they let me be a winner. Or the fact that that little girl stared at me, the top of her eyes looking over chocolate milk I bought, as if she's saying, hmm, I don't know. We, 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 get, we get home. I pull Greta to the side and I say, okay. I see what's going on here. You may have got this grandbaby, but the next one mine. <laughs> ah! Grandma almost wins, always wins. If I make y'all both catch an Uber home, you see who, <laughs> you see who win is. <laughs> Jesus, these people in my life. That's hard to hear, wasn't it? Yeah. Grandma always wins. Yeah. Did you say it's true? <laughs> I got you afterwards. <laughs> Family, we've covered a lot of things concerning our health, a lot of things. We've talked about the importance of understanding our bodies. We've talked about, you know, as believers, we shouldn't take our health for granted. We've even had panel discussions, two of them. On one panel, we had two physicians that came and gave us information about our vessels. On the other panel, we had two instructors from our healing school who shared with us that there could be some spiritual blockages that we have in our life that is hindering us from walking in divine health. As we went through that, though, we never lost sight, and we should never lose sight of the fact that our God is a healer. God is a healer, but the fact that God is a healer, it does not negate, it does not negate our responsibility for making good, healthy, and wholesome choices in our life. It doesn't remove us from the fact that we have a responsibility. <coughs> Just because our conversations have been extensive, though, that doesn't mean that there's still not a large topic out there that we haven't addressed. There is a large topic out there. There is that, you know, elephant in the room, so to speak, that gorilla at the table, that 500 pound beast that we seem to be ignoring and we haven't really addressed it. We've kind of danced around it, but we haven't gone at it straight. But today, straight at it we go. What is that topic? As a Christian, should you go to the doctor? As a Christian, should you go to the doctor? Meaning, my, when I say doctor, you know, there's doctors, there's nurse practitioners. Should you seek medical care? So as I say doctor, know that that's the backdrop of all of that. That's, that's a topic that d d tend to dance around. I mean, in, in some Christian circles, just the mere mention of the probability that you're going to talk about that topic is met with aggression and such disdain that you just don't want to talk about it. But we got to deal with it because the question exists. As a Christian, should you go to the doctor? Some doctors catch a bad rap in Christian community or in society because people equate a person seeking medical care as a person lacking faith or a person just not having enough faith. Once again, to make it crystal clear, we are always, say always. always. We are always saying that our faith rests in God and not man. Or in this specific topic instance, it rests in God, not a physician. It works in God, not the medical industry. It, it, it rests in God. As a matter of fact, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, in the Amplified Classic, we have Paul who's talking about or, or, or making having a discourse of the word of God or God's way compared to man's philosophy. And Paul says this. 
so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, human philosophy, but in the power of God. Indeed, our faith rests in God, not man. But yet and still, I don't see where the Bible instructs us not to see a doctor. There is a scripture, though, in Second Chronicles. Please turn there. In Second Chronicles, chapter 16, I'm reading out of the Amplified Classic, starting in verse 12. There is a scripture in the Old Testament that reads this way. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his foot, in his feet. Until his disease became very severe, yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but relied on the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. Now, go back to verse 12 up there for me in the Amplified Classic, please. If we were to read that verse in isolation, we could see how someone could potentially look at that and draw the conclusion that God doesn't want us to see a physician. If we focus in on the part that says, he did not seek the Lord, but relied on the physicians. We could see how someone could draw that conclusion. Family, that scripture is not a scripture that is instructing us not to see physicians. Instead, what that scripture is highlighting is the importance of seeking God first. The issue is in whom Asa put his trust. The issue is in whom Asa put his hope for deliverance. That's the issue. If we were to draw our attention to those leading four words before that semicolon, after that semicolon, after the word severe, it says, yet in his disease. Those four words give us an indication that there is a lot more to the story than what we're reading in verses 12 and verses 13. Those four words give us some indication that we have to look deeper to make sure we truly understand what's being said there. If we were to look at that in the voice version of the Bible, I know we don't have the voice on the screen, but we've actually made a slide of this one. In the voice version of the Bible, Instead of using the words, yet in his disease, and you can remove this part correct, yet in his disease, it uses the words once again. And if we read it in its entirety, it says, the voice, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa contracted a severe foot disease. Once again, he had the opportunity to look to the eternal, but instead he relied on physicians. That gives the spin that he's doing again something that messed him up the first time. Once again, he could have looked to God first, but instead he looked to the physicians. I got an assignment for you. Write this down. This week, I want you to read 2 Chronicles chapters 14 through 16. And I really want you to read it. You can pick the version that you want. Once again, I prefer that you do it out of at least two versions. The versions that I usually study out of are the King James, the Message, the Amplified, the Voice, and I like the, 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 the Living Bible. But you pick any two that fits your style. In summary, when you're reading those 2 Chronicles chapters 14 through 16, when you're reading those, here's what you're going to get in summary. Starting in chapter 14, when Asa kind of takes charge, Asa has some battles in his life, like physical battles. And in the natural, it looks as if the odds of him winning those battles, the odds are poor. But Asa defies all odds. He wins. He wins because he gets direction from God first. 
He wins because prior to him making any type of moves or taking any actions on the matter, he seeks God first. Then we roll into chapter 16. In chapter 16, another enemy sets its sights on Asa. Unfortunately, what Asa does this time is Asa goes and initially seeks assistance against his enemy from man instead of relying first on God who had never failed him. So as you can see, when you look at back to those two on the slide, can you put those back up for me, guys? When Asa got a disease in his foot, his tactic that he used in chapter 16 earlier was the same. Instead of going to God first, he went to man first. That is why those scriptures read that way. So when you're reading those this week, know that my position is that these scriptures do not frown on the medical profession. What they do is they frown on the fact that Asa chose the medical profession over God. Is that clear? Frankly, I don't, I don't see where the Bible instructs us not to seek medical care. But you know what? Let's, let's view it in this light before we draw any, any other conclusions. Go to Matthew chapter 10. King James Version. Starting in verse 5. Let's view it in this light because Jesus gave his disciples a charge to heal. Jesus did that. In Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 5, King James, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Sumerians, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of, is of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have, ye have received, freely give. Jesus here instructs his disciples to do what? To preach to heal, to cleanse, to raise, to cast. In summary, he is saying, I want you to allow yourself to be a vessel through which God's power can flow. He obviously gave those disciples a directive to heal the sick. Therefore, we can say being a healer is a Jesus given assignment. What is a physician then in principle, if not a healer? Is not a physician in principle a healer? Go to John 9. Once again, let's not conclude nothing yet. Let's take it from another angle. In the Bible, there are several unique ways that people are healed. But in the interest of time, and just to keep it all New Testament, let's look at three unique ways that people were healed. Starting in John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a blind man by applying a mud mixture. I'm reading this out of the Message Bible. Verse 1, John 9. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Now skip with me down to verse 6. He has some communications with his disciples. Then we end up in verse 6. And Jesus said this, and then spit in the dust 
made a clay paste with the saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes. And now, before we go further, think about that. That, le that reads as if Jesus made some kind of medical concoction. We could even say it like this, that Jesus wrote, filled, and applied a prescription. And if we really wanted to be specific, we'd have to say he wrote, filled, and applied a divine spit scription. <laughs> right? Verse 6 again. He said this and then spit in the dust, made a clay paste with the saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes and said, go wash at the pool of Shalom. Shalom means sent. The man went and washed and saw. Go to Mark five. There was a there was an account of a woman who was healed by simply touching the gar hem of Jesus's garment. This account is in it's in Matthew, just so you can put in your notes, Matthew nine. I have roughly verses 18 through 26. It's in there somewhere. Mark five, which we're going to read from verses 22 to 43, and Luke 8, verses 41 through 56. I choose Mark because the book of Mark has more descriptive verbiage that we can talk through. King James Version, Mark 5, verse 22, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little girl lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, as much, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and she had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now, we have to stop there because once again, we have a, a situation where the Bible is saying a person has gone to a physician. And if you're not careful, you can conclude that the Bible is saying you shouldn't go to a physician. I believe this is a scenario similar to Asa. This woman had been putting her confidence and her trust in physicians. But unlike Asa, I believe, my own personal belief, that this woman was going to physicians because she had not yet heard about Christ. It was likely, in her mind, her only option. Asa was different. Asa knew better. Once again, verse 26, and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and thou sayest, who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole from thy, from, of thy plague. Go to Acts 19. This third example, we're going to see that God worked through Paul. Acts 19 going to be in the Amplified Classic in verse starting in verse 11. God worked through Paul in a mighty way. He worked through Paul so great that even the residue of Paul's anointing was healing people. Specifically, handkerchiefs and towels and aprons, things that had come in contact with Paul, those things still had the power to heal and was healing people. Acts 19, verse 11, Amplified Classic. And God did unusual and extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, 
so that handkerchiefs or towels or aprons which had touched his skin were carried away and put upon the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. The voice version of those same scriptures would read like this if you if you have it in front of you. Meanwhile, God did amazing miracles through Paul. People would take a handkerchief or article of clothing that had touched Paul's skin and bring it to their sick friends or relatives, and the patients would be cured of their diseases or released from evil spirits that oppressed them. Those three scriptures illustrate that earthly materials, inanimate objects, things of this earth that are either applied by or that are come in contact with or in the control of God driven, God pointed, God directed people can be the conduit through which God can heal. If the healing power of God can work through mud and spit, garment hems, handkerchiefs, aprons, scarves, why in the world can't the healing power of God flow through the scalpel in the hand of someone that God has sent? Talk to me. But let's not draw a conclusion. Let's go one final direction. Because for sure, Anything in the hand of one that God has anointed, all of a sudden, it itself has the power to be a vessel through which God can do anything. But one final direction. Family, if we hold fast to the belief that God forbids his children to go to the doctor. I assert that we must also view my assertion, the medical profession as sin. If what we're saying is that God forbids us to seek medical care, then medical medical care seeking is a sin. And beyond that, all of a sudden, can a doctor be saved? Can a, can a physician be called a child of God? <laughs> because if you, hold that, if you hold that belief firm, all of a sudden you have to wrap your hands around that question as well. Or maybe what you say is, well, they can be born again, they can be saved, but the moment they pick up a stethoscope and ask to listen to the heartbeat of a patient, they're out of the will of God. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that a person that reaches out to provide CPR to someone in need, is that person a heathen? Is that your contention? We got to wrestle with it. Then if you're if you're saying that as a Christian, we should not see doctors. Turn to Colossians chapter four. Can a doctor be a child of God? In Colossians chapter four, Paul is kind of in his letter doing his kind of a roll call. And I want you to look at and listen to how Paul refers to Luke, the author of the book of Luke and the author of the book of Acts. It reads like this, King James Version. Paul says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. That's Luke. That's the author of Luke. Of Acts. Are we going to say that Luke is not a child of God? Of course we're not. (coughs) Likewise, it is possible for a person to be a physician and a child of God.
Let's step back, though, because it's time for us to kind of draw some conclusions and bring some things home. I do not view that the Bible says that a person should not visit doctors. By the same token, I don't believe that the Bible says a person shouldn't be a physician. It wouldn't make any sense. It would be irrational for that conclusion because it's God who gave men and women the mental capability to learn about the body to begin with. He is the one that gave the mind and the intelligence, the capability. It would be irrational for him to hogtie, restrict the greatness of his creation in that manner. I contend that it's not about the person being the doctor. What it is about in my mind, though, is that if a person is a physician, that as that person goes about doing their thing, that they must realize that whatever success they're having is not through their ability, through their intelligence, through their knowledge, through their might. Instead, it is through the power and might and wisdom of God that they're seeing their success. That's the way they should view the capability that they've been given to do what they're doing. I would also say this. It would probably be a good thing if a, if a physician was a godly one. But y'all know every doctor ain't saved. Every doctor isn't a Christian. Every doctor isn't a born again believer. But still, saved or not, it does not mean that God cannot work through them. As with any profession or any trade family, God created men and women with the capability to learn and gain knowledge and then apply that in, the, in good service to the service and the benefit of both God and man. A physician's no different. A physician is a person who has gained knowledge about the body and now is putting that knowledge into service for the benefit of God and man. When I think about how individuals view doctors, perhaps if individuals simply view people in the medical profession as individuals who have dedicated their lives to the ministry of healing, then perhaps certain faiths would, group, would view doctors differently. There are people who've dedicated their lives to the ministry of healing. In addition, I know this question is going to come up or this statement is going to come up, so I made sure I, I, I want to address this. There are some bad doctors out there. There are some bad doctors who are just going to take your money. There are some bad doctors who are going to give you bad advice. There are some bad doctors out there. Hey, guess what? There are some bad engineers. There are some bad plumbers. There are some bad accountants. There are some bad lawyers. There are some bad mechanics. We're not going to avoid that. In every profession, there are people who are less professional, less personable, less proficient than we wish they would be. In general, though, in general, I believe that every profession has its share of honest, good, hardworking people. 
Back to our initial question, though. As a Christian, should you see a doctor? Let's come at you from this way. When your toilet overflow, <laughs> do you simply stretch your hand and pray? Or do you call a plumber? When your car breaks an axle, do you simply read scripture and wait on divine repair? Or do you tow it to a mechanic shop? Come on, family. Odds are, odds are, you seek help from a person knowledgeable in your area of need. Think of it this way, too. With this question as our backdrop, this whether or not a Christian should go to the doctor, in every scenario, I would bet you, with the exception of bodily health, when something is in need of repair, a person seeks the consultancy of a human expert in that area. Why should things dealing with the body be handled any differently? I toured around whether or not I, was, I, would, I would say this, and I think I am, because it's the way I feel about it. And I want you to know before I say it that I have thought about it, and, and, and it's pointed. It's got a sharp edge by design. Look at somebody and tell them, this is how pastor feels about it. <laughs> All right. This is how I feel about it. You ready? Yes. Miss Janet says she's ready. <laughs> I'm not saying that we should not pray over everything that happens in our life. Your car not working, pray over it. I've heard of people doing that. I've done it myself. God, you got to get this thing. Ain't work. You got to get me to this. Is, I don't know. God, you got to turn this thing over. I've done it. I prayed over air conditions. I've, I've prayed over everything yes. that's gone on in my life. Yes. Here's my point, though. A Christian who on principle denies or declines or refuses medical care on principle, that they say that the Bible says you should not do that. I feel that that person, that individual, is a bit hypocritical if they do not hold the standard of zero human intervention on everything. Yes. The point I'm trying to make, and I'm making it direct, as a Christian, if you hold fast on principle to not take medical assistance, then doggone it, that should be your undying standard of zero human intervention on everything. But mm, if you take that position, if you decide you're going to wait on God to take care of your elbow, then doggone it, you need to wait on God to fix that leaky roof. You're going to wait on God to take care of that knee, then you need to wait on God to breathe cool air back into that AC unit at home. You're going to wait on him? You're going to wait on God for that eye? <laughs> then you wait on God to breathe heat back into that hot water heater. I'm serious. 
you going to wait on God to take care of your lungs? Then you wait on God to fix that broken car. If what you are saying is dealing with your body, you can only get help from the hand of God directly. Then doggone it, don't be hypocritical. You wait for God's hand directly on everything. If that's what your faith says you need to do. But do you wait on God's hand directly? Once again, I'm not saying we don't pray about it. I'm not. I'm clearly not saying that we don't seek God. But what I'm saying is, do you really wait on God's hand directly only for everything? Or do you testify that God sent the right roofer or handyman or mechanic or person your way to fix your problem? Is that your testimony? I'm not going to go to the doctor, but I thank the Lord that when my roof was leaking, he sent the right person my way to make the repair. You hypocrite. If God can send the right person to help you with your material issue. Why in the world can't God send you the right medical person to help you with your bodily issue? We're just talking as family, right? Once again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we don't seek God. But if what you're taking the position is that the only way things get done in your body is by the hand of God directly, if you're saying that God can't use a human conduit, he can't use a human vessel, he can't empower anybody, he can't anoint anybody, he can't send anybody. If what you're saying is it has to happen, your healing has to come by God and God alone. If that's your position, then doggone it, take that position all the way. Because God's ability, his power is not limited to bodily issues only. So one more time, family, back to our question. Should a Christian go to the doctor? The answer is simply seek God first. The answer is that you seek God first. And if after seeking God, the decision is to go, you go. <laughs> and don't let nobody give you no crap about that. If your decision is after consulting God that you don't go, then you don't go. And guess what? Don't let nobody give you no crap about that. Just make sure, family, if you make the decision not to go, that you make that decision following God's instructions, not because somehow you have read through the Bible, have heard someone told you that the Bible said that you shouldn't go. Because I don't see that. Gentlemen, can you put Matthew 10? Verse 7 and 8 for me on the screen in the King James Version. Because our departing words to our family here is going to be this. If after talking with God, family, you make the decision that you're not going to go, then fine, don't go. But if you decide to go, if you decide to go to the doctor, know this. Verse 7 says this. As ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8 reads, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. 
Freely ye have received, freely give. This last part here, freely ye have received, freely give, is not justification for you not paying for your, to your doctor the bill after service. <laughs> Y'all caught that. <laughs> yeah, freely you have received, freely give. That's not justification for you not paying your doctor bill. Pay them people. <laughs> they done put through the schooling and put in the work and spent some time with you, and now you're giving them people by paying their, pay them people their money <laughs> if you decide to go. See, I got you smiling afterwards. That's what I wanted to do. I hope I made that clear. I put, I put a lot of time in making sure that it was as specific as possible, but that gave you something so that I know we come across that. We come across that all the time, either just in casual conversation or maybe some of us come from different backgrounds and from different teaching. But as your pastor, I had to make sure that you get my thought on the matter. As always, along with scriptural references so that in your spare time, you can go back and explore on your own and always never stop there. But that bottom line and conclusion, family, is you work that question of whether or not you should go to the doctor <laughs> through God. And based on what you two decide, that's what you do. That's a wrap for the day. Let's pray. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you. <laughs>